I would now like to introduce our panel of speakers. Uh, Keith Mayerson, a Cincinnati-born artist, has been exhibiting narrative installations in galleries and museums since 1993. His ongoing series, My American Dream, which has evolved into a 428-page wordless novel and monograph, has been represented in separate ep exhibitions as chapters, and the ongoing series continues through today. Chris Byrne is a multifaceted figure in, art, in the art world known for his diverse contributions. He authored the original print and the graphic novel, The Magician, both esteemed works housed in the Rare Book and Special Collections Division of the Library of Congress. His curated notable exhibitions such as Peter Saul, 50 Years of Painting, and Susan K. Kahuraning, King's inaugural U.S. exhibition earning critical acclaim and recognition from prestigious publications like The Village Voice and The New York Magazine. He was formerly the chair of the American Visionary Art Museum, the institution dedicated by Congress as America's National Museum for Visionary Art. Karen Green is a curator for comics and cartoons at Columbia University. Since 2005, she has been instrumental in building a graphic novels collection and, in, and since 2011, an archive that now includes the original art and papers of Cl Chris Claremont, Al Jaffe, Howard Cruz, Jeffrey Robinson, S. Clay Wilson, Wendy and Richard Peeney, Fly, and Kitchen Sink Press, among others. And she co-produced the documentary, She Makes Comics. Cartoonist Mark Newgarden has been a creator of novelties, including Garbage Pail Kids, film, TV, and multimedia projects, from Microsoft to Cartoon Network, and print, from Raw Magazine to the award-winning Bow Wow series of children's books. His latest book, How to Read Nancy, The Elements of Comics in Three Easy Panels, won the Eisner Award in 2018. Newgarden currently teaches at the School of Visual Arts in New York City and is a noted collector of cartoon artwork, films, and printed matter. Thank you all so much for being here. If you'd like to get started. Thank you. Hey, 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 everybody. Um, it's so great to be here. We really are so very honored. Every time I come here, I think of that B. Cleveland cartoon of, I'm a famous cartoonist, get out of my way. <laughs> 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 the storied, um, you know, wonderful building that this is and so much history, it really is an honor and to be on the panel with my um, distinguished cohort here. Um, so they voted, not me, um, for me to go first. Oops, there we go. Um, so. One thing that um, she didn't mention was that for 25 years, I was the lead comics instructor. Some of my wonderful, now famous alumni are here, um, who are my students. Um, and I was the cartooning coordinator at the School of Visual Arts. And so I taught, oh my gosh, like six or seven classes a week. I taught more classes at SBA for longer than probably anybody there. Sophomore principals, junior thesis, senior portfolio, synesthetic model drawing where they would come dressed as Harry Potter. We would put films on in the background for a cool thing. Um, Pre-college, continuing ed, anime wonderland about anime and manga and the machinations and ideas and theories of it. So I've, I've read a lot of comics. I've read a lot of student comics. I was doing a residency at the Elaine de Kooning House with the wonderful Chris Byrne, um, who owns it. And Chris, and he'll tell you the story, said, OMG, Keith, I'm paraphrasing. OMG, Keith, I have this amazing work by this outsider cartoonist, Frank Johnson. I think you would be really into it. Do you want to read it? I was like, well, there's no TV, so <laughs> sure. Um, and um, this is the point. Everybody knows the 10,000 hour rule, right? It's been scientifically proven. You do 10,000 hours of something, you become a master of it. Maybe we can't fly, but if you want to be Tiger Woods, you play a lot of golf. If you want to be a composer, Mozart spent a lot of hours doing that. To be a great cartoonist or any kind of artist, you have to put in the 10,000 hours and it corrugates your cerebellum and hopefully you do it. Unlike outsider artists, we'll talk about the definition of, of that, like Henry Darger. We all love Henry Darger. Don't get me wrong, I was introduced to Henry Darger with Raw Magazine, but when you see so many pictures of the Vivian girls with little penises getting strangled by Turkish marauders from another planet, 
You're like, enough, Henry Darger. I've seen... <laughs> well, well, that counts and, torture 10,000 hours, to you. <laughs> Well, he did a lot of that, but it was sort of the outsider artist of not having a binary. I always feel like those... It's like, to me, good compositions are 60, 40, 70, 30 golden ratio arguments, both in form and content. Darger has the form, but in terms of the content, it's really good he had his art, because otherwise he would have been thrown in jail, probably. Um, so, but with Frank Johnson, he's not like that. Frank Johnson just didn't happen to go to art school. He never got published. He was doing this for his own thing. He was an itinerant musician that traveled around playing you know, music on the radio. And he was a recovering alcoholic. And so instead of whittling ducks in the garage, he was drawing comics. And nobody ever knew it. He didn't even tell his wife. And when he dropped dead, his grand stepchildren found all these school line volumes of comics that Dan Nadell found on eBay. We'll go into the story that Chris ended up getting. And nobody really read them. They, you know, Dan said, and we respect Dan, that they were important because they existed. But then I started reading them, like, wait a minute, these are actually really good. Like, they're really readable. Like, from his juvenilia, we're going to get into that at age 16. If he was my pre-college kid, I taught a lot of pre-college kids. I taught thousands of kids, students many of whom are now wonderful, respected artists. It'd be like, he'd be like a glowing, you know, pre-college student. It'd be like, this person has a future. Well, it, Keith, I think, not to interrupt, but I know we were talking about this upstairs. I think one of the interesting things, and, and again, in comparison to Darger, was just the amount of work. And when, yeah. when I first got it, and, you know, working with Lester, we, we showed it at the Outsider Art Fair. And it was impossible, really, because they're delicate, you know, they're older, uh, you know, the materials and all, you want to be conscious of that. But just in terms of the commitment and the obsession, that it was just like, uh, but it wasn't until you came along, and I think, again, you know, Lester had the idea of, like, we really need to get, like, very good photos, high-resolution photos, that we could look at them. And you were the first, really, to start looking at them in terms of the narrative and, and things like that. So that was made the book possible, made everything uh, uh, possible. Well, thank you. I, you know, I taught for years Continuing Ed. Continuing Ed, wonderful SBA historic program. R.L. Blackman used to teach Continuing Ed. People like Josh Baer were a Continuing Ed student, you know. But it's a lonely road to travel, uh, you know, when you're an adult out of school, still doing your comics and pushing that, you know, Sisyphusian boulder up the hill. It's hard. Um, but if Frank Johnson was one of my continuing ed students, I'd be like, this guy has something. We should get you published. Like, what's going on with you? Like, let's introduce you to people. Like, we have at SBA for many moons. Like, there have been wonderful people who came out of continuing ed, professional, really well-recognized cartoonists. So with that being said, um, one, he was also an avid record collector. Um, when I was reading thousands of these pages, what I ended up doing was I uh, streamed a lot of these bands that you could find you know, online of old hillbilly music, blues musicians, just to get me in the mood and to feel his spirit. Um, but maybe we should forward fast. So, so anyway, what they elected me to do, just so we get to the meat of the argument right away and we could, you guys could understand what it is that we're talking about. I'm going to do a digital comics reading. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> sometimes when I teach comics, I read them out loud for the students, sometimes in funny voices, if they inspire funny voices, right? Um, and just to take you through it, just so you could see what it's about, see what all the hoopla is about. And so we're going to talk about the very beginning, which was maybe one of the first comic books of all time, because it was 1928. It was Juvenilia. But this is the last the last volume in this anthology of volume one, there's volume two. Another 625 pages <laughs> more that will come out hopefully in the near future. Um, but I was going to take you through the story, if you don't mind. I timed this to be about 10 minutes. I'm just going to let you know that I'm not going to be droning on. I'm not a performance artist. I'm not a theater. So please don't blame me if my funny voices are bad or sound alike but just to make it edutaining for you. Um, so anyway, this is like one of these volumes. Karen has them all at Columbia, even though they're traveling to um, Switzerland for a, store, a show. Um, these, a lot of these books were around 70 pages long. And some of them are multi-year books. This is 48 to 52. And so it took him a while to do these. And we don't, we don't know that much about them. But anyway, you have the Calvin Kitty characters at the beginning, which he often likes to do. This, 
At age 16, he had many of these characters. Many of these characters existed when he was 16 years old, and now here he's doing them in 1948, decades later. So he stuck with the same cast of characters. They were his world. Um, and I'm going to walk you just through these first pages. So Wally's Gang is a group, is a, it, it's a, it's a club. Um, it's a, it's kind of like this, or what this used to be. It's an all, it's an all male club, although they let women in later. Um, and there are these guys who just hang out together and they solve capers together. A lot of these are caper comics, and they're really interesting. Um, but anyway, John. Um, John Michael Astor Astor is a millionaire here, and um, one, of the, one of the characters is trying to sell him a lottery ticket to raise money for um, the club, and also the winner gets um, to be in Wally's gang, which is you know, hopefully a good thing. And so here they're, they're selling the lottery tickets, but you'll see in the bottom left-hand corner, this mobster is saying, give me those tickets, um, and give me them tickets, sorry. And, um, and he just got out of, he just robbed a bank, and so he wants to find a hideout. And so he also wants all to manipulate the lottery so he'll win, so he'll get to hide out in the club. Um, he, uh, the, the woman's group um, also buys tickets, and he, he gets them from her, the leader of the woman's group. Um, and then they're deciding how they're going to pick the winning ticket with this cat. And then this is where, uh, with this spread, and normally they were like two, <laughs> two panels per page. Um, this is where I'm gonna go into the reading, so please forgive me, I'm gonna try to suture in here um, and uh, go through it panel for panel like a traditional um, digital comics reading. So here we go, so Wally is the bald guy. So he's saying, stand back everybody, pussy's gonna make the drawing. Meow, <laughs> number 2278 wins. Oh, goodness, I believe I got it. Mm -hmm. Give me that ticket. <laughs> well, now for a stroll down the street. I'm glad the boys sent my hat back. Say, what the? Meow, meow, meow. <laughs> Ugh, fish oil. <laughs> meow, meow, meow. Confound it, when am I going to learn not to trust that Wally's gang with anything? As he throws it in the trash. Here's the next spread. Yeah, I'm your new member. Huh? What's your name? Nick. Let's see, that W on your sweater, which is for, you know, Wally's gang. Let me unravel a little. There, that'll be about right, because it's going to be Nick's gang, huh? <laughs> hey, where are you going? Uh, down the pool hall? No, you ain't. Sit down there. And where are you going? After the groceries? <laughs> Never mind. The snake will bring the groceries. Snake? <laughs> Here's the next spread. Psst. Here's some guns for you, Nick. Slip in here, snake. Boy, that was neat, the way you robbed that bank, Nick. <laughs> Keep your mouth shut. What those guys don't know won't hurt them, pop. <laughs> Gee, I wish he'd pay more attention to what won't hurt me. <laughs> ha, I bet that's Dottie on the telephone. Ring. Keep away from this phone. There ain't gonna be no phone calls coming in or going out either. Meanwhile, on the state highway, I'll pull up ahead here. They ought to be along soon, Acme Trucking Company. Here's the next spread. Don hasn't called me all week, and Dent hasn't phoned me either. If that's all he thinks of me, I'll just get me a new boyfriend. You said it. Well, so long, Madge. Hey, kiddo, what about you and me taking in a show? Women, I'll never forget them out. <laughs> sure, I'm gonna hide out here till I'm set to blow for Chicago, why? What if the cops get wise to you? So what? I'm a respectable club member here, ain't I? I won the lottery the day before the bank was even robbed. Okay, I'll tell the cops if they ask me. You'll tell them nothing. You'll talk, you talk too much as it is. Next spread. Couldn't found that, Eric. This foot powder he sold me is no good. I'll have to go over and see him, see him about it. I wish I'd never gotten acquainted with Wally's gang. All they've ever brought me is trouble. Ring with his king. <clears throat> Is Eric in? Hmm, ain't you John Jacob Asta Asta, the millionaire? Yes, I am. Ha, huh. well, come right in. What, you're holding a millionaire for ransom? That's right, and you're not gonna put, and you're gonna put this note under his wife's door. Be sure and wait till it's dark, and tomorrow night you pick up the answer. But I can't read it, Nick. <laughs> Fool, who asked you to read it? Shut up and do as you're told. <laughs> Meanwhile, stand back, folks. It's a pretty bad wreck. Is he dead? Next spread. 
So, he's holding you up for ransom? Yes, and I'll give a thousand bucks to whichever one of you guys can get me out of this. What do we do? That mobster's got all the doors and windows locked. Uh, we can't put a phone call through, and the snake is the only one who goes in and goes out. Yeah, bring the snake, the snake brings in the groceries, and he takes the garbage out. So what? We still can't, we still can't none of us get out. Wait a minute, one of us can. <laughs> Meow! We gave Pussy a good dose of chloroform and tied a note to her tail. <laughs> then we put her in the garbage can and put a newspaper over her. When she comes out of it, she'll head for Dottie's house. Dottie's a good friend of hers. Fine. He has a baby in after Nick. Give it here and shut up. Just what I figured. The old goat's wife has squawked to the press. I'll have to bump him off. There's the next spread. And then this is a recurring character from the beginning all the way to the last issue. What? What a smash up. If it weren't for that big crowd gathering, I never got away. He's the bad guy. I better hop this freight if I can. I want to put a lot of miles between me and this place. Toot, toot. So, I got the company in this boxcar, huh? Hi, bro. Gee, pipe the prison suit. What do you bet I won't be wearing it when I leave this boxcar? Hey, Nick, that guy George is in the next room reading in the paper all about you robbing the bank. What? Where is he? Gosh, poor George. Hey, Dom, what did Nick do to George? Boy, he gave him an awful look. What? Was that all? Yeah, there's the awful look. <laughs> Next spread. City garbage dunk. The cat is waking up. <laughs> Help. Dizzily walks off. Meanwhile, ha, it ain't no trick at all to slap that hobo to sleep and get his clothes. No, Mr. Assass, we haven't found the slightest clue to where your husband's being held. Hmm, I wonder if Wally's gang might be able to help. He's had connections with them for a long time. I'll just call Wally up and see. Meanwhile, yeah, we gotta bump off the old guy before we blow for Chicago. He's too hot to turn loose now. Yeah, the old hometown again. Drink Culpo. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> I bet the kid that tied that on the cat's tail will grow up to be good and mean, like me. Well, now to go up to Wally's gang clubhouse and settle an old score. Who are you, a new member of Wally's gang? Beat it, Slam. Oh, goodness, and this is Be Kind to Animals Week, too. <laughs> Meow! The, lowing, the lady sewing circle will never stand for this. What's up, Mrs. Spookendike? Why, this is Wally's gang cat. Oh, that awful Wally's gang. I'm going to take this tag right down to the police and report them for cruelty to animals. <laughs> Chief, we got a report that Dave Homer is on the loose again. They were transferring him to the new prison, and his old pal Brutus crashed a truck into the police car. Brutus got killed, but Dave got away. He was probably heading for this town. We got to grab him on sight. Gosh, and here I am in this big Aster Aster kidnap case on my hands, too. Say, Chief, Mrs. Spootendike is here to see you. She says it's very important. Cruelty to a cat. <laughs> that old busybody, tell her to come back a year from next Christmas. Tee <laughs> hee. Yeah, it was easy knocking this old storekeeper out. I knew he kept some guns back of his counter. And now I'm going up to see that guy that slammed the door in my face. Nick, here comes that guy again. He looks like he's got a gun. Shall I plug him? Knock, knock. You shut up. I'll handle this. Nobody answers. I'll just walk in, but I'll keep my heater handy. Stand where you are. I got you covered. Don't shoot, officer. OK, you got me. OK, I'll go back and finish the rest of my murder rap, huh? So, you dodging the, the law, same as me, and a murder rap, too. Well, well. Hey, who are you? Never mind dropping your gun. Just start walking. Remember, I got you covered. You ain't going to shoot me, are you? You're going to do the shooting, buddy. There's an old guy that's got to be bumped off, and I ain't taking no murder rap. You're wanted for murder anyway, and you can do it. If you don't do as I say, I could kill you, and the cops will pay me for it. Snake, bring Aster Aster out here. Chief, I demand that you take that Wally's gang to task for tying this tag on the cat's tail. It's cruelty to animals. The lady sewing circle, ah, uh, for Pete's sake, give me the tag and I'll see what I can do. Now go away and leave me alone. Of all the nerve, here I am working on a kidnapping case and we've got an escaped murderer running loose and she bothers me with a, hey, what the? Kelly, Dugan, Ryan, I've located Aster Aster. Yeah, it's my old three-way bean blower I invented one time. What about it? Give it here quick, Don. You ought to see what's going on in the next room. Now, if I could only ease around this corner, um, the door, and aim this thing right. Now, when I count three, let him have it. One, two, ow, ow, ow. Huh? <laughs> yeah, 
I didn't do it, Nick. Now's my chance. Get up, you mugs. I'm taking over from here. No, you don't. Drop that gun. I may be an old man, but with this in my hand, I'm a match for all of you. Line up against the wall. <laughs> Step on it, Sweeney. I hope we ain't too late. Poor old Mr. Aster Aster. We got a report that Dave Homer was see seen coming in here, too. Maybe we could still save the old man. That poor, helpless old man busts the door down. Boom. Well, glad you came around, boys. Here's your men. Huh? So your men took him all to the station, Chief. Yep. Don and Dent get the credit. It was Don's bean blower, and Dent did the blowing. <laughs> you guys are pretty lucky. There's rewards for all of those guys. Mr. Aster Aster disclaims his part of the reward, and you'll probably get it all. Gosh. It was our idea, tying the note to the cat's tail, too. So... Officer, do your duty. Arrest these men for cruelty to animals. Oh, maybe Dent's girlfriend will fix me up for me, but I'm ashamed to tell anybody how it happened. You're pretty good at sewing, Madge. How are you about fixing up my sweater? I tore it accidentally. Sure, George, where did you tear it? See there, I actually tore off the part of the letter W. Huh? Now strange. You're the sixth one now that accidentally tore a sweater in the same place. Madge, fix the letter on my sweater, but still the elbows are worn out. I'll issue you a new one. I'll just throw the old one away. Hmm, here's something can I use? I declare, Wallace doesn't seem to care who he takes into his club anymore. Oh, Dent, you were so brave, stopping all those gangsters with nothing but a bean blower. Bah. And Don was wonderful, too, inventing the marvelous bean blower. Hmm. <clears throat> Maybe you didn't know it. I, too, played a hero's part in the capture of those gangsters. What did you do? I bought the beans. <laughs> and that's the end of the story. Thank you for your patience. There's no way we can follow that, yeah. you realize? <laughs> well, now you get the idea of the meat of the argument. I think they're pretty good. And this is 1948, years before the first Tintin album was ever released here. Obviously, there's Popeye and Little Orphan Annie and the continuous comic strip, um, but this is all contained in a comic book. But um, I wanted to ask Mark, we were talking about it earlier, where you, you mentioned some of the source material that you, you I kind mean, of... I, I see it as um, really informed by a lot of the you know, narrative scripts that would tell a story you know, throughout the daily strips. Um, if you go back to the ones we were just looking at... Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go right here. Oh, every, certainly Gasoline Alley, um, I see a lot of Moon Mullins, um, Toots and Casper, a lot of scripts that are not reprinted today and nobody's read in, you know, 75 years. But um, just the examples we were looking at, if you noticed and you look closely, every one of them is signed per page. He was thinking about these as individual four-panel daily strips. So, but, but at the same time, impossible to publish as graphite, right? Like, no, right. It, yeah, no, but I, I, my guess is that he was probably doing one per day um, and entertaining himself that way. But... I mean, none of us know. This is all conjecture. You know, Jules Pfeiffer once said that uh, when the collected editions of Gasoline Alley came out, the ones that Chris Ware edited, he realized that Gasoline Alley was the first graphic novel because it does read like one long, continuous story. And he said you didn't get that sense when you were reading things one day at a time. You had 24 hours wait in between the next installment. I think for, for Wally's gang, though, first of all, it's, it's kind of interesting that you started with the last one because what's so striking to me is when you look at the very first one, which is in the book, his, his development, there's like no background at all. Um, he has that really interesting speech balloon tails that are just like <laughs> um, And his, while well, his characters, I mean, Wally still looks basically the same. He's been bald for, you know, 20, 20 years now. Uh, He's 16 but, here? Yeah, he's 16. <laughs> the point I'm making with this slide is the first published comic of new material in a long format comic. Historically, some people think New Fun Comics is a first American comic book. This is 1928 when he was 16. This is actually 30 pages, this story. That's continued in volume two. And it's number 91. Well, that, that's what I want to ask Like for you, know, you and Mark, who actually are draftsmen. Could that be, or do you think there really are 90 before that one? Oh, are oh, there? Yeah. OK. I don't believe it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, some of the pre-college kids are born, the really good ones are just born to do it. 
And they've been drawing since they were six or seven or eight. Yeah, I mean, these look much more sophisticated when I first saw them, I think, the, the first What really one. strikes me about his subject matter is how much it seems drawn from the, like, the short films, the short B films, comic B films with, you know, Thelma Todd or Patsy Kelly or, you know, the Ritz brothers. It's, it's like fast-paced gags, uh, uh, a, a bad guy who who roils up the situation for the for the good guys and you know then virtue triumphant they they seem to be really not even so much inspired by by comic strips of the time but by what he might have been seeing down the local odeon uh, when he paid his nickel the East Side Kids, the Bowery Boys, that whole Absolutely. genre of uh, Absolutely. Perfect <laughs> example. Gang, gang comedies, you know. Uh, no, you bring it up. So here's the Bowery Boys, which was what ended up being, uh, Kayla E. did Bowser. the- what, Bowser. Uh, Bowser, <laughs> please, sorry. <laughs> wonderfully did the, the, the book design for us and chose that to be the cover. But I always think that this is sort of the first underground comic, if Zap Comics is 1968. Um, here I have Frank Stack, uh, Adventures of Jesus, which sometimes is considered the first underground comic. These, this, this might have been one of his boozing periods. It's the only comic he did in ink. <laughs> and these are hobos who deliciously love their, ho I hope that's not on PC. They deliciously love their hobo lifestyle. And a lot of the strips, they are two page stories, but they're all about getting their fix. Um, here's the fabulous furry Freak Brothers. With I love the flies that are always hovering around all of them. <laughs> Here's um, just Rory Hayes, just to, as a particularly dark underground comics. And this, here they're, um, you know, they get dead cats and they're resting on the dead cats. So, so Keith, the fact that there, were, there was only one, one comic in the 50s, right? That kind of explains it, that it's like a lost weekend, a lost yeah. decade or so in terms of. Yeah, I, I thought this was, I won't read through this, but this is particularly pertinent now, where they still pay people to vote off the street. <laughs> this one, because he was an alcoholic and then a recovering alcoholic, and then he comes back and does this one later, it made me wonder if this was uh, him indicating how much he missed something or indicating... Uh, that he was back in the midst of it again. <laughs> Mysteriously, some of these pages are a washed out light blue, which happens when you have liquid poured over ink. And so I wonder if it was a bottle of something that spilled. Yeah, I wonder how autobiographical they are. Exactly. Minsky's, that's awesome to see Minsky's. I mean, he was in Chicago. Minsky's, was Minsky's in Chicago? Started in New York, but they that's were what I thought, everywhere yeah. Everywhere else for a while, yeah. Okay. Well, Chris, you, you were going to talk a little bit. I have, a, I have some other firsts here that we, we could go through um, if you want. But um, Sure. Um, to me, this is sort of a, a great discovery, too, because it was just so prescient for all kinds of things that happen in future years. You know, the idea of caricatures and grotesques. You know, of course, Basil Wolverton, this is the famous first uh, uh, appearance of Lena the Hyena that won the little Will Abner Al Cap contest for the ugliest person on earth, and here's um, years before that, an interesting Wally Skin character almost looks like the Bowser Boys. Um, Screwball Comics, Powerhouse Pepper. It looks very much like Powerhouse Pepper. This character, maybe he did read Basil Wolverton. Who knows? Um, How accessible would that have been in the Midwest at that time? Those were all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Um, Here's Smokey Stover, um, which famously had a lot of chicken scratch, which is what um, Kurtzman called uh, what Wally Wood and Bill Elder were doing to fill up all the panels. And chicken fat. Chicken fat, sorry. Um, this isn't in the first volume, it's in the second volume, but he had two volumes of the Juke Boys, which gets really experimental, which gets, a, you know, this is a rubbing, they have collage elements. Um, uh, panels as narrative devices and structural devices, lots of jokes. And, um, and obviously, these were done in graphite. And there was no way in his time that these could ever get published, also including the format. And I think this foreshadows you know, the wonderful Raymond Briggs and Miriam Catan and um, these other younger people who are working today. Um, I'm old, I guess, now, because they aren't so young. Um, 
but <laughs> you know, now that we can print wonderful um, hard um, hard copy graphic novels are done in graphite. So anyway, that's that's my series of firsts. But um, uh, and these are just how it gets better. But maybe I don't, Chris, I don't know if you want to talk about your discovery of them. Yeah, um, or and just give a little bit of the the biography. What's known? So um, I. Um, I don't know, some of you might know Dan Nadell. Dan um, brought these to my attention in 2016. And, um, you know, again, it was just, they were kind of overwhelming in terms of their you know, 28 notebooks. And then there's uh, a series of, of loose drawings. Uh, Hank the Hunchback, one of Karen and my favorite, which is a serial that's, uh, but they're, they're, they're. You can't even believe how non politically correct these things are. <laughs> they're all jokes about a hunchback, like a, not just like a Richard III hunchback, but like a but hunchback. They're gaggy, right? <laughs> they're, yeah, they're gag panels. Like hunch, Hank wants to go on an amusement park ride and he's too short, so he lies on his stomach and his hump makes him. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's what we're talking okay. about. Okay. <laughs> it's I took awesome. out some of the mild PC, on PC stuff. It was very mild, but um, Karen's convincing me to put Hank the Hunchback in volume oh, you, two. Oh, you need to. Yeah. Okay. See? Yeah, in, exactly. Hank's in. People need to know. There's always time. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, again, it, it was introduced to the work by Dan. Dan did write, he published two articles in the Gansfeld issue three in 2005 in the Folk Art Museum summer of 2005 and I was talking about with Mark they're kind of hard to find online I mean I guess you can track them down but they give a little bit more um, history in terms of his you know his collecting uh, uh, 78 RPMs and you know to me that seems similar I don't know if everyone saw the Harry Smith show at the Whitney or there's an anthology of folk it's kind of that dedication and that kind of cataloging so Dan addresses that um, I think as Keith mentioned uh, there's uh, 2300 pages of images in the notebooks and 131 unbound drawings um, again not known you know uh, Dan was in touch with um, Don Doherty, who was uh, Frank Johnson's step-grandson. So uh, Johnson got married fairly late in life. He met his wife in 68. Uh, he died in 79. Um, so he was um, 67 when he passed away. So a lot of these anecdotes would be coming from the step-grandson, uh, Don Doherty. And so, um, let's see what else. he. Um, you know, as Keith mentioned, he worked as an itinerant musician, traveling. I didn't really kind of know exactly. I mean, basically, you show up and you audition for the radio station, and then you have a set list. And you play live for, I guess they can book you for a couple days or something like that. So it seems a very transient kind of existence. You know, the parallel universe here is Robert Johnson, who was just that, who wonderfully recorded his music as that kind of musician that then influenced all of rock and roll. You know, right. this is more of uh, Brian Wilson did Smile, and nobody was influenced by it. I mean, Wild Honey was good, but... A lot of recording of that. Um, so, yeah, um, so basically that's all sort of part of this collection. We didn't include it in this anthology. Um, then he returns to New York in 1940 and works as a shipping clerk until the uh, end of his life. Again, as I mentioned, he meets his wife in 1968. So it's very sort of uh, kind of, uh, we were talking about like, you know, Shakespeare's biography or something, you know, it's just really bare bones. A lot of it kind of filling in, you know, even this idea, I mean, with alcoholism, just because he only produced one notebook in the 50s, you assume you know that would have something to do with that, but no one really, there's no documentation about it. Um, so in terms of the numbers, so there's, I think I mentioned there's 28 total notebooks. Um, started when he was uh, 16. The first book that we looked at is book 91. Um, So I guess the, just the way this project evolved, um, you know, after we got the books and Lester was involved and we had them photographed, we spoke with Karen and, you know, obviously Karen's the top person in this field, so I was very in, excited that she was receptive. Um, we showed them at the Outsider Art Fair, but I think the big change in the way this developed, you know, again, really looking at it like 
Via Darger, some of these artists, uh, Susan King, who's an artist that uh, work was discovered. She's still alive, but you know, her her work hadn't been shown. You know, her early drawings. So same kind of sort of exercise going through this and sort of positioning it. But I think that for me, and again, I sort of defer to everyone on the stage in terms of their knowledge of comics and uh, that th the shift really happened I think when Keith started to look at them and, lo and look at the stories so uh, from I'm that time on my hands. yeah they were, they were good you were you're held captive in well, East Hampton well, it's like good <laughs> comics take you on a journey and hopefully you're seeing how these really bring you into another world it's just like reading Carl Barks or reading Hergé or something that you go into another space and you have these complicated characters that you you really get to know, just like he did. Plus, you had to develop all those voices. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're, you know, sometimes they happen in your mind when you, it's synesthetic. You know, it feels like they, he must have been sutured into the avatar when he was creating these guys. I, I can easily picture him laughing out loud as he's drawing these. Absolutely. These are just some highlights to show the 10,000 hour rule. I mean, Mark and Karen, what do you think would be next for a project like this in terms of like really tracking down specific references and stuff? I don't know if there's going to be any more biographical information forthcoming that way, um, you know, in terms of especially since, uh, you know, as people die and pass away, their contemporaries do too. And you get do further. we know why there were only 28 books found? Sorry? Do we know why there were only 28 uh, books found? No, I mean, other than just assuming that he didn't start at 91, that, that there, you know, and uh, no, and again, I think the fact that no one was tracking it, again, according to his step-grandson, right. that no one knew they existed, and it was posthumous discovery. Who found them? Uh, his wife. And, so and where did she find them? Where were they? I guess in the house. I know they... Um, Dan said that the drawings could fit into a cigar box, but I don't. Uh, there, there's the th no, they can't. The, the drawings, <laughs> not, 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 not the notebooks, but, uh, but uh, the. Oh drawings. right, yeah, the drawings could fit yeah, in a cigar so box. I, don't know. I mean, that's again speculative. I don't know how uh, cleverly disguised as yeah, a box of know, cigars. How, they were hiding right in plain sight. You know how so. Um, but I, I first came to this stuff in the early 2000s, and I'm pretty sure Dan started with just the drawings because he had a pile of them, and he was right. trading. So I have, I have a few now. Right. I know other cartoonists that have a few. Um, right. And I think, I think the more he sort of um, pressed, the more they sort of went back and, oh, we have these other things, we have these books, et cetera, right. et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, you know, it really started as an, an outs a project with an outsider artist. That was the a real impetus yeah. for me, anyhow. So, I have just a few. We're going to have the artworks or the individual drawings in volume two. Here's just a, a, a couple of them. Um, again, is pants fall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, there's Pansel. a lot of these where uh, I'm comparing it to Gary Panner because Gary's a genius um, and loves work like this. But um, these are a lot of them are just done on memo pads in in his spare time, just like getting his yayas out, doing these beautiful drawings. This makes me think of Daumier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, just heads, uh, yeah. endless yeah. heads. Yeah. Um, Characters. <laughs> Karen, I'm curious too, because you've touched these, you've had them, you've housed them at Columbia. What are they like? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, like in terms of like an object, because Chris, you were also saying like there, there's something very fragile about them. Well, not fragile, but you're aware of there's kind of, uh, I almost think it's sort of aesthetically anything that's sort of aged a little bit. There's kind of this patina and they're- Oh no, they're fragile. They're, yes, they're super, so super fragile. It right. makes me very anxious to turn pages on some of them. Some more fragile than others. Right. But, it's pretty um, low-grade paper. Exactly. Books. This is uh, something he got probably at the dime store, yeah. the local drugstore. Um, like they're, not, they're not to, to they're read. They're not yeah, high yeah, quality. They're not even high right. quality notebooks. They're, you know, like little things that you jot, jot things down in. But they're, you know, about the size of a comic book, a little smaller. Um, he, he puts the year on every page, which I find fascinating. You can see it. Is that a convention at the time that you were? Sure. Yeah. He's, okay. I think he's, he's signing them like a daily strip. But is that a signature? Because it always looked like an S sure. to me. It's not an S? S48? 
They, they, they kind of they vary a little bit, but um, he does sign them every two pages. Um, what's curious to me too is is that um, that uh, I was going to say that I, I sort of lost my train of thought, but um, what's curious to me is that oh, some of them have really long dates, like they they'll be like 1949 to 1954, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like when David Lean was doing Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> He, he, exactly he says, what that, it's like. yeah, like Peter O'Toole. <laughs> it's like, well, he would say like Peter O'Toole is looking off in the desert in one direction and then turns around and looks in another direction and three years have transpired between those cuts. And so like he took breaks, which is interesting and kind of. But the the pages must be physically brittle. I mean, it's really good. That they, they are. Were. You know, we are very cautious often about accepting things on old paper. Uh, especially from a, a time period when it was more acidic than you would prefer. Uh, it's, it's not in great condition. You want to turn pages very carefully. When we, <clears throat> when we present something like this in the reading room, we have these foam cradles so that it only opens up about that much. Um, to, it's it's just it's kind of funny that something even like a mini comic that you spent a dollar on gets treated with all this incredible care and respect once it ends up in our rare book and manuscript library. But you know we want people to be able to read it in ten years, in fifty years, in a hundred years, and the only way to do that is to treat it with enormous respect now. And there could be a point where we would decide that they're too fragile and that we would digitize them and make them available that way. Do, do you think be on non-archival paper and done with like a blunt tip of a graphite pencil, probably from a pencil sharpener attached to a desk? Like, are they going to last? Will they exist? They'll for last. Time? Okay. Yeah. Just be careful. <laughs> paper does pretty well. Yeah. Turns paper out. does it, pretty well. Yeah. It, it, Not as good as parchment, but it does pretty well. And Mark, <laughs> I, I'm curious as a creator yourself, but also a comic scholar, and obviously the author of How to Read Nancy and more. How do you think they hold up, you know? Oh, they're fun. I, I, I got to hand it to you. Your performance really enhanced it for me. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think they're fun. He, I think he's got a really good gift for dialogue. Um, and I think he's really comfortable with the drawing, too. You know, it's, it's I don't think he, I don't think he could have cracked a syndicate with this skill set, but I think he could have possibly cracked an assistant job um, maybe a comic book job early on, yeah. 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 If he was, you know, inclined that way. But what's fascinating to me is like, this was, he was just doing this for himself. He was entertaining himself. Is um, there anything formally inventive or anything uh, like they talk about, like the fourth wall, this kind of stuff? Is there anything that's? I like that, the pointy noses. Yeah, I mean, I I feel like he's really reacting to the the books that he's he's working in. He's really reacting to the pages. He's really um, working with the, with the form of those composition books. Um, in terms of, you know, they're doing basically what American comics of that period do. Um, you know, some of the subject matter, especially in the Bowser Boy books, is definitely a little seedy compared to some. But if you've ever seen, like, issues of Hobo News, which didn't run comics, but ran gag cartoons. Mm -hmm. Very similar, very similar kind of stuff. And it really, uh, when when he gets when uh, uh, Dave Homer hops on the train and and the the guy said, that says hi, Bo, that's like such a a moment of time. Yeah. You know that because that's what you called a hobo. You called him Bo. It's it reflects. Very much, it reflects the the world that he's living in, uh, and it's fascinating to me to see the evolution. Like I mentioned, the the tails on the speech balloons earlier were these kind of weird, scratchy things, and now they've become more uh, conventional. And in the later ones, they actually become more inventive again. He's, but Wally is always bald. <laughs> it's like he was born bald and he's going to stay bald. Nobody really ages that much. 
um, so interesting time to goes on. So interesting that a 16-year-old kid is focusing on an old bald guy as, right? his, as his main character. That is perplexing to me. <laughs> and I, I feel like it must be some sort of reflection of people that he knew. Yeah. Charlie Brown didn't have a lot of hair. Right. Right. Yeah, but... But Schultz wasn't 16 years old when he started drawing him, was he? Wallace and he was a kid, and he was a so kid. He clearly lost his hair. <laughs> yeah, Charlie right. Brown has got that hopeful little squiggle. <laughs> well, talking about avatars, I think that Wally must have, I mean, he is a great neutral kind of character. By the way, this is in volume two. This is uh, 121, the volume that comes after the one that I read that will start out volume two, and they have a reunion party. And so all of his favorite, and this has helped me anthologize it because all of his favorite characters come back and talk to each other. And um, Scott, um, who's Chris's wonderful assistant, actually went back and found when they first appeared, even though I didn't exactly follow that. But um, you can see the cavalcated characters here. But you know, I, I, you know, it's interesting. Like I, I don't know if this is maybe I shouldn't even say this, but um, you know. Interestingly, at SBA, and we should talk about what outsider art is, uh, but uh, in my last few years there, I left in 2016, but around 2010, I had my first student who had the letter that they had Asperger's, um, which is now an unused term, or that was neurodivergent. And um, more and more, and very quickly, we had by the time I left, at least two or three neurodivergent students in every class. And I'm not saying, I, 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 you know, this is my armchair therapy, but there's something about the idea of suturing into a world and being in control of that universe that these students were really good at, in particular, and tended to be really good critics and, and things like that, really wonderful in the class. And I wonder. Um, when you're going into these worlds and these people are your friends. I mean, I read the Charles Schultz biography again recently, and Charles Schultz was kind of a cool cucumber. I mean, he's a wonderful cartoonist. Who knows? Who knows? It's an umbrella term. But um, I wonder when he's in these worlds and um, being an old man at heart, if Wally is his main Harry Potter guy to be his robot avatar, um, if something, I mean, he must have felt comfortable in, in, in this world in a way that maybe he didn't feel comfortable or it was a meditation for him, which I think is part of the juice of this, that it's the power of it. But uh, I, I don't know, we, we were talking about what outsider art is upstairs. I, I think that that term is a, is a almost derogatory term, that it's, you know, it's used as kind of highbrow, lowbrow, high art, low art, outsider, market is a way of excluding things from consideration. I, when I was in grad school, <laughs> when I was in grad school, my sister-in-law and I guest starred on Ready, Set, Cook. <laughs> and that was the coolest day ever. And like four years later, Simon Shama asked me to be his research assistant for the history of Britain miniseries, wow. and I Those. talked to my advisor, and I, because I, because if you did anything without this woman's permission, you were just eviscerated. <laughs> and I said, Professor, I got this opportunity to to work as Simon Shama's assistant for this miniseries, and she goes, Oh, well, you like TV. <laughs> <laughs> so there is this kind of hierarchy that is imposed by gatekeepers. And outsider art has been deemed the stuff that the gatekeepers don't consider art. But I think we've all progressed far enough now. And anybody who goes to any kind of indie comics festival and sees the quality or the lack of quality of the work there, uh, the lack of uh, maybe artistic polish. quality, polish, thank you, that's even better, the lack of polish doesn't detract from the power of the story. And these stories work. They work. And when you read them, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to me that you chose uh, to start it with one of the later ones instead of going chronologically. Because when you get that sense of chronological 
development and how he goes from this very primitive looking art to much more polished art, it's, it's an amazing journey to go on with him. Well, also, I wanted to ask Mark and Keith, so uh, book 126, Keith, we talked about that a little bit, where it's sort of, it, uh, it's, it's the last book. It references. Oh, I, just, I just scroll back to show this is my evolution. The reason I, I jumped from the, the 16 year old to, to the later stuff was frankly the 10,000 hour rules kicking in. He's worked out a lot of the, the bins and the, and so I, I wanted to get to the good stuff. Um, but, you know, it gets pretty quickly to the good stuff. But, but where that last one where he's referencing his early, his very early rudimentary kind of drawing style yeah. and that like when he recalls these characters. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I should get off this. I mean, in terms of like what's good dra drawing, it's almost like this, uh, it brings back a certain time when he was drawing it. So he's able to mimic the early style later. So it's very, this is, this very is the reunion comic that Chris is talking about. Uh, um, yeah, for me, outsider art just means, it, first of all, everybody knows Jean Dubuffet. He was the um, creator, so-called, of Art Brute, was done, which, which was art that was done by mental patients or children. And he loved the direct nature of that work, how, um, how um, it was really about expressing people, people's ideas and emotions without an idea of an audience and how, you know. Like, it was the, asylums though too, really, Keith. I mean, it was really people that were like literally separated, you know. Um, uh, but I don't know, I, we were talking, when we were talking about this upstairs, I mean, this is just kind of an intuition I have, but I, I do feel like when you go to art school and you deal with art with a capital A, you know, it's, it's a certain kind of thinking and then if you're, someone whose girlfriend broke up with them and you decide to make a wire sculpture. It's a, and I'm not, I'm not belittling that. I'm saying it's, it's, it's a, for me it's a paradox because I think like Darger is formally innovative. I don't, he's, it's not like he's a pop artist, like I'm the first one to use screen prints, but the, like the very kind of uh, rudimentary uh, mechanical reproduction that he'll use or the Xeroxing is at the purpose of this larger narrative. So it, it kind of, because he's not chasing novelty or firstness, it almost, I, 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 again, I think sometimes these things show up. And that was my question to you guys, is you know, people who draw comics, is there anything that shows up here that's, that's innovative or in terms of the storytelling or something, uh, just as he gets involved in this other world, you know, as he's just driving the story forward? Well, you've read more of it than I have. So maybe, I, I mean, I see it as sort of, you know, just sort of square in the middle of what comics narrative was at this period. It actually may be lagging behind 10 or 20 years. I think he was thinking more about the comics he probably read as a 16-year-old than maybe as a 38-year-old. Well, that's, that's a rougher crowd. The, the Bowser Boys are a rough 10-year-old crowd. Right? <laughs> Bowser, I mean, the Bowser Boys really do stand apart from everything else in the book for me. And I, I think it was wise to open with them. Um, but I mean, there's, you know, you don't do this unless you love what you're doing. I yeah, mean, this I is know. like, this is about just, in, you know, enjoying yourself on, pa on paper. There's no other reason to do this. And it, it seems like it's also a kind of escape, like this is a world that he retreated into. Yeah, and that's I mean, why nobody else knew about it. Comics are traditionally drawn for an audience. And here's a cartoonist with a career who never had an audience. And that, I think that's the first. It's not yeah. subverting any conventions or anything that you see, I mean that. No, I think, I, I think he's like really, um, you know, as, he's, he's aspiring to the conventions. I mean, I'd, I'd love to know what's missing. I'd love to know if he did, like, um, there were an awful lot of mail order cartoon courses in the early 20th right. century. T cartooning school had been around from the 1910s on. Um, and, you know, I've seen a lot of amateur comics that, you know, fall into that category. I've never seen a lifetime of it. Don't before. people usually yeah. obsess with the technique when they start out as opposed to the storytelling, like they'd be more obsessed with mimicking the technique and that's what's some, interesting. Some, yeah. yeah, some, but not necessarily always. But, you know, obviously he had a real, he had stories to tell, but he only was telling them to himself. It was fascinating. You know, Charles Schultz um, started out from one of those schools, Draw the Pirate. Um, and that's, he never went to art school too. I mean, obviously he's not an outsider artist. He was so good 
with the correspondence school that they hired him. Yeah. And that was his first job. And really, um, Peanuts was inspired by all of his friends who were working with him. Even the little person who was working with him helped the design of the character because she was so lovable and, and cute. In quotes, but uh, the, you know, for me, like the the there there's a certain passion and drive for it, and I think, you know, it's not the beautiful Belgium, which is close to Switzerland, clockwork of an Hergé Tintin. However, for me, like the capers are intricate, like in he's dealing with a lot of action going on simultaneously and switching in and out of that action. And so I know like the greats that we talked about that he's emulating are doing that probably in a superior way. But I think for me, like the one, the talent that evolves, which is raw only merely because it's in graphite at the end, but I think it's nuanced graphite um, is, is I think for me on par. I mean, I, I, but I, you know, this gets where it's really subjective when we could duke it out in the comics fan club, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there's like a certain, there's a certain melancholy of it. It kind of reminds me a little bit of John Stanley and Little Lulu and things like that. There's like a weird sort of lonely air in it that I feel, I, I, I like the synesthetic vibe of it that it gives me when I'm sutured into these worlds. I, I think, and, and it's, it's endless, like it, there's, no, there's no finite, it's like an RPG game that has no walls that you can't penetrate, uh, which to me is, is, is intense. I, for me, if, it's outside, Outsider again is just like you just didn't go to art school. Um, but I don't think that this is, in terms of its storytelling, Outsider-y, and I think, you know, I also have to say that these were not printed in comic, the, the strips that we're talking about were not printed as a comic book in the time that he was making these in the volume. And so we could split hairs here. And Fantagraphics really did not want to lead with the very first American comic book never seen because <laughs> it's a hard definition to crack. But if it's a long form original material that's in one volume, to me that's something because it, it is a comic. That is the definition of a comic book. It's longer than 12 pages of original stories. And Popeye and stuff was collected in anthologies. And by the time we're getting to this era, there are obviously comic books. Um, I want to show you the, um, this is the last book that he did, which does to me, it might be directly inspired by Tintin. It's sort of like the, the last Tintin or like the Aztec Tintin. So this is late 70s. Yeah, this is the last book that he did. And this, this is um, our villain who um, came out of the mail. Th that's Dave, who like Apocalypse Now has taken over uh, <laughs> a rural village. Um, and uh, I love Dave's Fido Dido hair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, I'm not sure how PC this is. However, he does really respect like the people that he's rendering. But this is interesting. This is when he dies. This is and I love <laughs> the last panel. Is he's drawing the border, so he's like, ah, ah, ah. It's like that Harriman strip that was on his desk when he died. There's yeah. <laughs> a few of them. Yeah. I mean, that's it. I mean, and it does remind me of like Schultz drawing his last comics right as he retires and the, he dies the day before the last one's printed or Keith Haring saying, oh my gosh, just give me a pen. You know, I just need to draw that he just kept at it. And these are the same characters that appear in number one or number 91. You know, his last you... words, how many people have read the whole book? <laughs> 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 wow. I was saying upstairs, this reminds me of the very last um, Sunday Barnaby strip, which is a subtractive strip and where everything starts disappearing. First the backgrounds, then the subsidiary characters, then the main characters one by one, and then it's just left with big empty panels at the end. I haven't gone through all of them just because I, I didn't want to go through them with their fragility just for my own amusement. Uh, so I've only read here and there. And, and this last story kind of uh, uh, tar targets uh, what I was going to say and, and absolutely jettisons it. But I was going to say that uh, 
you were mentioning the cartooning schools. There are also these like books on how to draw cartoons. And uh, we have one from like 1920, 25 maybe. And it's like, this is how you draw a, a, a French person. This is how you draw an Italian person. And they're like, they're, they're ethnic stereotypes. And then of course you get to the blacks, the Asians and the Jews. And those are ugly, ugly, ugly drawings. And for the most part, until we got to, to Yama here. Um, for the most part, he's a very, it's a very white world. He doesn't have like the, the horrific uh, racist black sidekick anywhere, which was in movies at the yeah, time. I was, I was just watching the old Warner cartoons that are not, yeah. Yep. Uh, um, so, and everybody knows these stories. And I love Tezuka, you know, the creator of Astro Boy, and they always have a disclaimer at the beginning of them saying, like, <laughs> well, there were no people who weren't Japanese in Japan when Tezuka was drawing these, and he was a great humanitarian, and so on and so forth. But there are a few, there are a few pages that I took out, but they, uh. were, they weren't at the expense of the people that he was portraying. They were sometimes drawn in a manner that you wish was a little less stereotypical. But I will say, in that first comic, and I won't make people go blind by zooming back to it, there's a Jewish character who's a prominent Jewish character who has agency and is a good guy. Um, women aren't allowed into the club for a long time, but they are eventually. And hopefully, even in the examples I showed you, when I was reading aloud, they're treated with respect. Even the people who, like that, the main, um, the main person of their club who isn't conventionally pretty in the manner that the Betty Boop-like characters mm -hmm. are, has agency. She's a strong female protagonist. And she actually appears in other strips where she's not made fun of, which I think is interesting. Like she's not objectified or, or lampooned for her looks. There's this Poncho character here um, from Mexico and of course, he's wearing the garb on the bottom right. Um, but he also has agency in the story. And he's a main character who's not demonized in the story. He's sort of like a, uh, and so anyway, they, they fall a little bit. And maybe we could historically forgive some of his stereotypes the minor amount that appear. Not forgive, but understand. Understand, not forgive, right. But uh, I, I want to say that he gives them agency, and they aren't villainous, nor are they treated as beneath the other white characters. And yeah. I do want to say, as a queer person, this is, a, for a long time, an all-male club. And I should have put in some of the pages where they're um, sleeping together in a bed and you know i don't know about lincoln and all of his like hanging out in the same bed with his <laughs> i guess his fellow lawyers in his early years but there's something very homosocial about this group and um freud as as wrong as freud is would say that they might be pre edipalized subjects <laughs> because they really enjoy hanging out like friends like little boys that was not that uncommon then. I was just yeah. watching Gold Diggers of 33 this morning, and uh, the three female roommates are all sleeping in the same bed. Yeah. You know, there's that great, this is a little bit out of the time period, but there's that great um, capital on a, in the Cathedral of Autun of the Three Kings, and they're all lined up in one little bed, and they're, it's, oh, it's beautiful. Look it up. Three Kings, Autun, A-U-T-U-N. I promise you, you're going to go, oh my god, that's beautiful. But it's also it's three kings sleeping in the same bed together. If you were if you were a traveler in like the Middle Ages or the early modern period, you slept with strangers in the same bed in an inn. I mean, it's just, yeah. to me that's not that's not so strange. Yeah. Well, homosexuality wasn't invented until the Belgian scientists came up with the term in the of late course, 1800s. Of right? course, of course. No, no, nobody. No, it's, I, I read John Boswell. I know how far back it goes. Right, right, right. <laughs> I'm just saying there's a, there's there's something a little queer about these characters, not in a sexual way, but it's interesting. So would people like to buy some books and get them signed? Yeah. There you, you go. Guys, thank you for being so patient. <laughs> and, 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 and really, we're, we're so honored 
both Chris and I to be on this panel with Karen and Mark. It's so special and for you guys to be here. So and to see some wonderful um, faces from the, the recent past. So thank you guys. Yeah, yeah. Do you just do one panel at a time?